Hey everybody, this is Greg Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Pedixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at R. Crumb's The Yum Yum Book. This was uh, created in 1963. Uh, R. Crumb drew it for his um, soon-to-be wife, Dana Crumb. He was a 19-year-old a virgin at the time, and he was in love with Dana Crumb. And he basically made this love letter to her, which is basically, I don't know, an 80-page comic, 60-page, beautifully drawn comic as a token of his affection for her. This uh, was published in 1975, long after, well, not that much long after R. Crumb and uh, Dana Crumb separated. Uh, R. Crumb has a little uh, introduction, which they reprint on the slipcase here. I just want to explain to the reader that I drew this story when I was 19 years old and still a virgin. Now I'm 30 years old and the book seems somewhat adolescent and immature to me. Um, this book has been hidden away all these years until 1975. But I guess uh, Robert Crumb's lawyer <laughs> thought that it would sell like hotcakes because our Crumb was a commodity by 1975. You know, he was a big name. So uh, they put it out, but uh, I don't even think he made much money from it because he kind of gave this whole book to Dana Crumb. That was part of the alimony. So she owns it. She It's, it's copywritten under her name. And uh, R. Crumb worked on this book for six months. And all the color was done with Prismacolor pencils. And uh, I guess it worked because Dana loved him for it. And there's interviews with Dana Crumb where she's, you know, it didn't turn out very well, their relationship, but she still looks fondly at this book as a token of love from her ex. So the story here is Augie and the Beanstalk. And I love this uh, beautiful city, this weird little city on an island. And it's just this uh, patchwork all kinds of architectures and things. And it's a little funny animal world, you know? That's what our crumb was doing in 1963. But look how beautiful these colors are, just with the pencils. This is amazing stuff. And uh, it's all about this guy, Og Ogden. And he just doesn't fit in. He's one of the, he's basically our crumb, obviously. His father wants him to go to business school so he can, um, join the family business. He doesn't fit in at school in the intellectual world. He's a, uh, just doesn't get it. You always see Fritz the Cat. Very early appearance of Fritz the Cat. And Ogden uh, didn't really fit in with anyone. He, his roommates are all intellectuals who debate all the time, didn't really fit in with that scene. And he hears all of his buddies talk about their sexual conquests. And, you know, Ogden, just like R. Crumb, just didn't have the tools to get laid. He uh, didn't have that uh, savoir faire. So he's just this lonely, messed up little guy. And, uh, you know, he'd go to hip coffee houses. He'd go to political protests. He never fit in. Just didn't get it. But this cartoon is so just amazing. He's 19 years old and our crumb is this great. I've, I've often said that it's almost a shame. Of course, it's not a shame that our cr crumb got into underground comics. Because if he didn't and just became this great funny animal cartoonist, that would have been another nice thing for the world. But then we would have been denied the amazing shit of our crumb that he did for, uh, you know, undergrounds. So, uh, he's not that bright either. He tries art. He's not that good. So here's a difference between our crumb and the Ogden. Because our crumb did at least uh, excel in that sphere. He even tries religion. He goes to church. It's a beautifully drawn church here. It's an alligator priest. I mean, that's another toad. And uh, Ogden doesn't get it. They kick him out of church. Yeah, 
tries to get laid really pathetically. Just he doesn't even know how to talk to women. Just like our crumb, you know, claims that he was. He starts drinking. Look at this beautiful panel here where he's drunk. So this is his point of view. All the buildings are askew. People, everyone looks all mutated and weird. God, he's so good even then. So he has these ladybugs that live in his dorm room. They, uh, they're just kind of like these old biddies. And um, he comes home really drunk and he's just annoyed by them. And he stumps them all. He stumps them to death. He kills them. And then he realizes what he's done. And he's full of remorse and feels horrible. But mainly he's scared that they'll hang him, you know? And he's like, I don't want to die. So he buries the ladybugs. <clears throat> so there's no evidence and he won't get caught. His friends are talking to him here. I hope you can see this pretty good on your computer screens. These colors are just gorgeous, just with pencils. But you know, our crime is such a perfectionist. You know, you barely see any like, that just looks like total full color. So then the, the great, where he buried the ladybugs, this giant vine starts growing out. I'm sorry, a beanstalk. And it kind of captures one of his legs. So he's kind of forced to rise up with it as it grows. And it goes higher and higher. And eventually, oh, I love this little picture of the moon. That's such a great little face there. Also, just look at this. So not only is he doing great solid colors, but he's doing all these gradations. It's beautiful stuff. Right here, look at that. The deepening blue here. So he ends up, uh, eventually the beanstalk keeps growing, and he ends up on this other planet. And it's this beautiful paradise. It's like the Garden of Eden. And for once in his life, he's happy. He loves the fact that there's no one there because, you know, he doesn't fit in with anyone. He's tired of trying to impress people and failing. There's all this great food there, these delicious fruits. He loves it. And uh, for the first time, he's happy. He spends his days frolicking in the lake, eating great food all day, sleeping under the stars. But then one day he, uh, you know, wakes up like his normal routine jumps to jump in the lake and he, he's kind of like sigh. He doesn't want to eat any of the food. He's basically bored. He's in a rut. Uh, so he says, I'll go on a journey. I've kind of been just staying around the same area that I've uh, landed in when I first got here. So um, he makes himself a walking stick and starts traveling. And all of a sudden he hears this little singing. He hears some singing. And when he comes out to this glade, he sees this woman, but he calls her a monster. He's just like, ah, monster. Cause he comes from a funny animal world. So he's never seen a human being, let alone a human being that's like 10 times his size or more, 20 times his size. And he just finds himself intrigued by this creep monster though. Um, he says, ah, oh, it's kind of e easy on the eyes. And she, she gets scared when he wakes her up. And uh, this is, like, I think, Dana Crumb. God, sorry. I can't stop talking about the color. I can't believe he just did this with pencils. It's so beautiful. So they meet. <clears throat> and he's becoming more enamored with her. He's very enamored with her. But uh, it turns out that she just wants to eat him. She's eating all the critters on this planet. She uh, reveals to him that, like, I just love eating little critters. Um, I've eaten them all. So I'm glad you're here because now I have one more critter to eat. He's like, squeak. So he escapes. And uh, he's safe. He's in this underbrush that she can't get into. But he's still thinking about it. He's like, what a beautiful creature. And he's almost like, shit, I don't care if she's gonna try to eat me. I'm, I just have to see her again. Or just, you know, he's full of passionate lust for her. 
such beautiful art. I just can't believe how young our crumb is and how he already knows his shit. So she promises not to eat him if he comes out. Maybe she says, oh, I'll give you a kiss. And he runs up to her and kisses her and then runs away because he still doesn't trust her. She still wants to eat him. And he, the first kiss he gets from her, probably the first kiss he's ever gotten, he's just, he's to the moon. He's just in ecstasy. So he's like, I want to do this again. And he keeps sneaking up on her. And uh, here they actually have like a little tete-a-tete and um, he, she basically says, actually, I've been lonely since I've eaten all the others. And he's like... And she's, she's from another place, too. She's, she wasn't born here. And he steals another kiss from her. And she tries to eat him again. So he's already on to her. So he knows that he has to, if he wants to kiss her, he's got to jump away pretty quick. Because she says, I can't even help. I can't help myself. I love the taste of toad flesh. He is just so... He's doing jumping jacks. He's doing backflips. He's so in love with her. He's so excited by her. So he just goes... He just keeps stealing kisses from her. And she's all like, knock it off. Constantly ambushing her. And she was trying to eat him, but he's too fast for her. I love how he's just all, he's so in love with her, but he's like, come on, fatso, try and catch me. It's very R. Crumb. I mean, this, this is very cutesy, and it's almost like a children's book. You can still tell it's R. Crumb. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's a part of R. Crumb's makeup that, you know, he's in love with this girl, but she wants to eat him and kill him, basically. So he kisses her again. She's kind of trapped in this bush and she just gets enraged. I love this. Her face turns tomato red. And she's just like this Amazon warrior. He's freaking out. She's chasing him. She's on the warpath. But he says, oh, you're, you're too heavy for this log. Be careful. And she falls into this stream. And he gets so, he finally realizes like this, this can't go anywhere. Well, she, she just wants to eat me. And... I love her, but, you know, she's never going to love me back. So he gets back on his vine and goes back down to earth. Like, that's a great panel. Just beautiful cartoon, Amos. And when he gets down to the city where he's from, the vine has totally uh, strangled the city. It's, um, it's ruined the city. Um, most of the buildings are demolished. All people can eat are beans because no ships will come near it because the island uh, depended on other places to send them food. So they can't eat the beans. At least they have the beans from the beanstalk. And I guess they're going to drop a bomb uh, on this vine. And this guy is like an anti-war, <clears throat> you know, no nukes guy, saying this will kill us all if they do this. We have to find a peaceful way out of the situation. There's just so many inventive touches in here. All these animal characters all have great expressions on their faces. I love this weird little house. It's a player piano, but it has a door and windows. Just, I mean, has nothing to do with the story, but just, our crime is so inventive. It's such a great cartoonist. These guys, some of these guys see him and like, it's a toad, grab him. So I guess while he's been gone, there's kind of like this anti-toad hysteria because the ladybugs know what he did. And they basically spread all these like tales of like the toads. That's why we have this vine. So most of the toads were exterminated, kind of like in pogroms, you know. So they throw him in jail. He's, um, they're going to execute him in the morning. It's beautiful drawn shit here. But then his buddy shows up from his college days. And he brings him some food. He tells them the whole story about how the ladybugs spread this, uh, spread stories 
and how the toads brought the curse of the beanstalk. But he can't get him out. He tell, uh, The toad tells him the whole story about this other world he was on with the, the voluptuous woman. So they take him forward uh, to the courtroom just so he can uh, get, have his fate decided. And the court's basically like, we find you guilty of everything. <laughs> like, so all these very serious charges. <clears throat> so he's back in his jail cell waiting for his execution. But then Gunter shows up. And uh, I guess she chased him. Not out of affection or anything. She just still wants to eat him. She's like, how can I catch the little bastard when they all run under those stupid beanstalk vines? Oh, I'm sorry, bastards. She's trying to kill anyone she sees. She just loves eating little critters. So she pulls the whole beanstalk out of the ground and rips it up from its roots and frees the city. She throws it all in the ocean. And so now the city is uh, beanstalk free. Everyone's cheering her on. The mayor says, oh, I would love, I want to thank you in person. Our sincerest thanks for what you've done. And she just eats him. And then she starts eating everyone else, shoving her mouth full of all these citizens of the city. They're, it's like a Godzilla movie. They're all running in fear. She, she's insatiable. She's like gobbling up hundreds, thousands of them. She never seems to get full. Finally, she does. She's satiated and she takes a nap. So the um, they're going to put a bomb next to her. They're like, she's asleep. Let's uh, blow up this big bomb. And the frog is still in jail. He can see this all happening from his jail cell. And he's like, Guntra, wake up. I'm sorry, that's her name, Guntra. Wake up, Guntra. She, he still loves her so much. And so she reaches into the prison, not to free him, just to eat him. But he escapes because he's very uh, slippery and quick. And he takes the bomb and he pushes it out of the way, uh, away from Guntra so it won't kill him. He's kind of caught in the blast, though. He looks kind of messed up. And finally, she's like, you saved my life. And she seems concerned about him. And Og Ogden looks pretty fucked up. But he's still alive. And... He's basically like, go ahead, just eat me, you know, whatever. But before she eats, she says, before I eat you, I'm going to give you a kiss, which is what he always wanted. And it turns him into a human being, just like the old uh, fairy tale. And she's thrilled. She's like, you've changed into a man. And she just jumps on him. And, uh. They make love. And they decide to uh, find their own place in the universe. And they find a boat and uh, look for a place where they can spend their life together. They sail away. Just, sorry. <laughs> look, at, look how beautiful that green is. That deep, I don't know, olive green. It's just an amazing green. And this sky here trying to do this sunrise the blue everything just constant amazing colors all with pencil and so I think they make it to Cleveland which is I think where they grew uh, R. Crumb and Dana Crumb you know like were married and we see them now <clears throat> and they're living in peace and love <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> happily ever after <clears throat> And he basically gives advice to the love lord out there. Just be patient and keep plugging away. You'll find your love. Just like Ogden the Frog did. This is strange because Art Crumb kind of made a career out of drawing himself in his cartoons. Was, you know, he's a character in almost all of his, a lot of his cartoons. And he, I don't know who this is. Art Crumb never looked like that, I'm pretty sure. So he just draws this generic dude for himself. And that's Dana. So very strange uh, how he does that. You can see it's just definitely not the art crumb we know and love. 
And uh, that's it. Nice little back cover yellow. So that's Art Crumb's The Yum Yum Book. It's uh, just gorgeous shit. It's so different than most Art Crumb stuff. But, uh, you know, like he says in the introduction, he was a big sap at the time. And uh, he, was a, he was in love. But just for the cartoony alone, this is worth it. But it's actually, it's a pretty interesting story. And it's pretty funny. So uh, if you can find this, I think they reprinted this. There's a, it's called like the Big Yum Yum Book, and it has an introduction by Harvey Picar and Dana Crum. So if you can find that, I hope you can. But uh, I don't think I'd be even paid that much for this. I think they made a lot of these because <laughs> it's 1975, first printing, and I didn't get it for much. It wasn't it wasn't that expensive, so definitely worth being in your collection. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time at the Pedixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies.